Hey, Madtropolis. We're rocking it today. We're going to learn about digital fleets. You heard me right. Not digital brokers. I'm done with that term. Digital fleets today. So welcome. Grab a beer. Get your popcorn. And join the crowd over on YouTube. You guys know the rules. Head on over to YouTube because I know that a lot of people are on LinkedIn. They're on Twitter. They're on Facebook and every other app that I stream on. But really, you wanna go over to YouTube, hit that live chat button, so you can make friends and chat away in the comments, they're very busy. And then hit the subscribe button so you know when I go live. I have about two years worth of videos on YouTube, um, and they're, they're educational. They're all good videos, so scroll through and educate yourselves, fools. So here we have the most amazing guests ever, you guys. We are so lucky to have these two with us today. Uh, we have Cameron, we have Eric. Welcome to Mad Gains uh, and Madtropolis. Uh, welcome to the crazy land of all of us in the transportation industry trying to unite and be more educated. And thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having us. Um, let me pull up and make sure that I didn't mess anything up with technology. But for now, um, Cameron or Eric, you guys want to introduce yourselves real quick to the group? Sure, I'll start. Um, Eric Fuller, I'm president and CEO of uh, US Express. Uh, I've been uh, in this role since 2017. Hey everyone, my name is Cameron. I'm the president of Variant, which uh, is newly rebranded. We, Some of you may have seen, we started out as US Express Ventures and, and recently did a rebrand about two weeks ago. Oh, was it two, only two weeks ago? Yes, it, may, it might have even been shorter than that. Time flies. I actually just had a, uh, a my second little girl. I have a two week old at home. So time is kind of a blur for me right now. Oh my goodness. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, is it good timing or? <laughs> I don't think you can time this. No, time? Time. <laughs> well, I have a few friends that have a baby <laughs> and they're like, we're kind of happy about COVID because we're all home and we can take care of the kid. <laughs> exactly. And Which then I have exactly others who are like, I want to die. <laughs> concentrate here than at home. Um, okay, so uh, I just wanted to double check that I did everything right. Um, and it looks like I did. Uh, sorry about the, uh, the background. So what I want to do, you guys, I have a little adventure planned for you guys. Oh boy. Yes, yes. Because I don't want anybody to think that, um, that they're going to come on the show and just have an easy, breezy time answering very standard questions. So hold on one minute. Let me play my music that some people have PTSD over. And what I did is uh, people who come on the show, they're getting smarter and smarter. They're watching past shows, but there's one past show that I know a lot of people didn't watch and it's with Doug Wagner. And it's because it was like three weeks ago. So it's getting buried now, but it's a good show. Poor Doug Wagner came on here and he thought he was gonna come on for 15 minutes and he was just gonna answer a couple questions, similar to what I told you guys, but I lied. Eric's sweating over there, I can see it. <laughs> so I'm gonna play a game called um, Never Have I Ever. It's my favorite game in the whole world. And uh, you have to be honest, because I'm a lawyer, so I can tell if you're lying to me, Eric. Um, Cameron would never lie to me. And so here's your first question. <laughs> I'll let Cameron go first. Good, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'll let Cameron go first. Because he's tired from having a baby, so he might make a bad answer, which would be good for all of us. Yeah, right. All right, Cameron, you have to say, I have or I have never to this question. And no thinking either. Okay. Um, have you ever been kicked out of a bar? I have. Oh, you have been kicked out of the bar. Would you like to tell us the story? Uh, I don't think that's part of the game. I think I just have to answer. I have to answer. Are you sure you're not a lawyer? That's part of the rules. I have to go into the game. <laughs> Cameron, you had time to think now. Did you Have you ever been kicked out of a bar, Cameron? I, yeah, sorry, Eric. Oh, I have never. I'm trying to make sure I can see in his eyes to see if he's telling me the truth or not. <laughs> all right, all right. We'll go on to the next question. I should make people explain stories. Um, Cameron, now you're going to get like 50 messages on LinkedIn asking oh. you, how'd you get kicked out of a bar? I have two, man. First time, second time. You're never going to talk to me again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here is the next question. Eric, you're going first now. All right. <laughs> All right. Hold on. Let me get my scary question. 
See, this looks scarier music. Eric, you the answer is going to be I have or I have never. Okay. Have you ever signed a contract without reading it? Oh, I have. You have? I have. Cameron? Yeah, I'm ashamed to admit that I have. Yes. Most people say they have, and then I'm happy because that means it's job security for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, I'm going to save the next two to when you guys aren't expecting it. Get you guys nice and comfortable in the hot seats. Um, okay, so first of all, Eric, you said you've been CEO since 2017. I mm -hmm. think I heard you say that. Yep. Um, so, but you were actually, for those many people out there, because we have a broad audience of shippers, brokers, carriers, insurers, attorneys, some people have never met you before um, mm -hmm. and never knew about you. So you, were you born into trucking? Pretty much. Yeah. If you think about it, my, my granddad uh, had trucking companies all the way back in the 70s or 60s. Um, even before deregulation. So yeah, I, I've pretty much been around trucking my entire life. And do you, were you like expected to work in trucking? Was it what if you decided you wanted to be a lawyer instead? Yeah, I think it was kind of unspoken. I don't know that it was expected, but it was, it was probably a little bit of that. Now, now my brothers, I have two uh, younger brothers and one's sort of in trucking and then one's not in trucking at all. So I guess it wasn't, you know, entirely required. When you have Thanksgiving at family events and stuff like that, do you guys talk about trucking? We do. Uh, my middle brother is in trucking media, and so he wants to, that's all he wants to talk about. So we end up talking about very much about the industry, yes. <laughs> do you guys get in, like, trucking arguments, too? There, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've got he, has very, he has different opinions than I do about certain things in the industry. And so we'll get into some, I, would, I was about to say semi-heated arguments, but they're actually heated arguments. So you know they, they are. They become heated. <laughs> Cameron, were you born into trucking? I was not. No, I, I kind of fell into it. I, I, oh, that's all of us. Career. Most yeah. of us, I mean. What's that? Yeah, like the re I think the rest of us that, that just kind of fall into it somehow. And, and then it's very difficult to escape. Right? Well, you can't get out once you get in. Out, right? So what were you doing before the trucking industry? Very briefly, I did a very brief stint on Capitol Hill. I was working for a senator and, and that's what I thought I wanted to do with my career and where I could make the most change. And, you know, that was, uh, I learned very quickly. I felt very quickly out of love with politics and, and just looking to get out as quickly as it's humanly possible. How old were you when you fell out of love with politics? Immediately when I fell into love and got <laughs> it was a very short love affair. Um, so I was, I was there for less than a year. And then uh, started my, my, really my trucking career, my, my transportation and logistics career with, with Coyote Logistics back in 2008. Oh, really? We were just doing, you know, 100, 200 loads a day, not, not very big at the time. And then I left, you know, 15 months, 16 months ago, it was about $4 billion. So spent most of my career there, right, right up until uh, I met Eric. And then when did you meet Eric? Eric and I, I think, first connected on, on LinkedIn in March of 2019. And yeah. I, I think we, we talked. The first thing I, I thought, it was like, you know, I would love to talk to Eric. I knew who he was, obviously. Um, and, but I, I said, you know, I'm not really interested in going to the asset side of the business. And he said, well, why not? And I said, really, there's no one really investing in technology in any meaningful way. There's not a no. lot of growth. The, the player, it seems really, relatively static. He said, that's why I'm calling Think there's a better way to do it and honestly it was our, our i completely subscribed to his vision and what he wanted to do to, to us express and, and and with the broader industry and honestly i quit my job <laughs> like within i don't even know eric how i was i was i was on board and, and left almost immediately yeah it's amazing quick so what was your idea eric like what and what got you thinking about this idea because i can tell you that um um i get very frustrated with the trucking industry Sure. Um, and I well, try to make an impact and that's how right. this started. Yeah, it is. It is definitely a, a uh, industry that's very set in its ways. Right. So not a lot of it, really not a lot of innovation. In fact, there are really large companies that operate literally on 1980s technology today and actually do quite well at it. Um, yeah. So it, it's pretty amazing. But um, it was probably early 2000 to mid 2018 started really paying attention to the digital brokers and while a lot of the incumbent companies kind of said, ah, I'm not real worried about the digital brokers, I really dug into it and said, you know what, there's really 
something we should be we should be a little concerned about here. If you think about the ability to scale if the digital brokers can create a model in which there's true connectivity and they can bridge the gap between what the asset providers provide, which in my opinion is consistency, uh, maybe better service, a little bit more visibility to the asset and accessibility to the assets um, and more consistency in the product. If the digital brokers can use their technology to, to bridge that gap, they really could put a lot of pressure on the market share for the asset guys. And so I started, started thinking through that and decided I wanted to learn more about the digital brokers. And so I spent a lot of time out in Silicon Valley, a lot of time talking to digital brokers, talking to different companies, um, and really just kind of kicking the tires all around. And, and I kind of left after, you know, a few months uh, with the impression that one, I still believe that there is an opportunity there, um, that the digital brokers can truly do something that could be transformative. But I felt like they were missing one key component, and that was the full-time connectivity with that asset. They, they still didn't have control of the asset. They didn't have connectivity of the asset. And that's really what they were, were truly missing um, in their overall model. And so as I was thinking through that, I thought, you know, really, if you think about all this technology and how they're approaching the business, it might be a better fit for asset-based trucking as opposed to, uh, to as a brokerage. Hmm. Because they really, the, the, the key element that the third parties are missing exists in the asset world. And so I started thinking about that initially. And then um, as we were exploring that, I was, I'm a big fan of the innovator's dilemma. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that book, and it really talks, it, it's an incredible book about disruption and how disruption happens. And typically incumbent companies really struggle with disruption because there's this big major change management issue and yep. being able to get people to change their behavior and the things that they do day to day is very difficult. And so yeah. as they actually started, go through a cycle, don't they, Eric? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and usually they, they just go back, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very difficult to get people to actually, you may get them to change for a little bit, but actually for that change to stick is very difficult. Um, and so started thinking through, well, it, we can layer in some of this technology, but it would be incremental and it may not even get the full benefit because of the change management issues and all that. Started thinking, well, maybe we just can reinvent this business model. Maybe we, maybe much like the digital brokers, take the, all of this technology and this approach and come up with a new business model, a new approach. And really, if you think about trucking, there's so many inefficiencies and so many problems in it's that unreal. model that it's ripe for disruption. And yeah, it is. I, I'll give you one story. This is probably five years ago, but it stuck with me. Mm -hmm. I was talking to one of our drivers and he was telling me this, this situation that had happened a few months back. And he was telling me that he, it, it was just like this, this uh, combination of events and, and it ended up, he was stuck in a hotel room for like 10 days and he practically got forgotten. And he was just sitting there literally in this hotel room with no truck and the, the company practically forgot him, unfortunately. And so I was talking to him and I just said, why did you stay? Why, why would you stay when we screwed up that bad? And he just said, it's trucking. Everybody does it. If I go anywhere else, it's the same thing. You just have to realize what you're dealing with and, and you know, you, you find a company you're comfortable with, but everybody, nobody's different. Everyone's like that. And I really, that stuck with me because I'm like, that, that's wrong. Like we, that's things that we can fix. We, that we should not accept that type of environment in our industry and, and think that that's okay. Um, and so that was kind of where a lot of these ideas about, hey, can we do something different and what can we do and what does it look so what did you, okay, so you went on this exploration of digital freight brokers, whichever, whatever that means. What did you find out that meant, by the way? Uh, I'm mostly always automation and optimization, okay. right? So applying a lot of technology to optimize and automate a lot of the manual functionality. I um, mean, you think about like a, a, a brokerage, there's just a lot of people in a big room on the phones and they're digitizing a lot of that interaction. And I felt like that, if you look at the asset base model, it's the same thing. It's so people heavy. There's so many people, there's so many touch points. You'd be amazed in our legacy business, how many 
uh, touch points just to dispatch a tractor. I mean, it takes all of this work by somebody in the office and then the driver doing something in their cab and then somebody else doing something back in the office and then the driver doing something just to get a driver to dispatch on an order to go pick up a load. It's, it's so inefficient. It is. Uh, we actually talk about that a lot on the show, and we have shippers that watch the show, and they are so frustrated often with um, how behind the trucking industry is, oh, the actual yeah. trucking asset companies are with regards to innovation. And it's funny because a lot of us will point the finger right back at the shippers, but I'll leave that for another day because I have shippers on here that uh, now are going to light me up in the comments. <laughs> um, but I'll tell you that uh, it's talked about a lot here. So what did it look like when you went home? And you're like, all right, um, I'm going to make some changes. Yeah. And you've got a board, you've got people who've been around in your family who've worked with this company forever. Mm -hmm. I'm going to dramatize this. They're like, look at this whipper snapper coming in here, 2017, yep. thinking he's going right. to change us. They sure. didn't say that probably, but it's the movies in my head. Right. <laughs> so how did it go? Well, you know, one of the things in that book that I mentioned earlier, the innovators dilemma, one of the, the big issues is that in order to really disrupt things and really change a, a, a paradigm and change an industry, you, you have to be comfortable with potentially cannibalizing your existing business. And so that was the first thing that we looked at and said that we, we were willing to go far enough from a disruption standpoint that we were willing, if, it, if that were how it played out, to cannibalize our existing business because we thought this was a better approach. Um, and so one of the things I did with my management team at the time before Cameron even came on board is we got the entire strategy team in a room and we whiteboarded uh, for literally days. And one of the things that I made the entire group go through is list all the paradigms in the trucking asset based business model, all, all the things that are absolute, right? Things that have to happen, you know, whether it's like drivers are paid by the mile, customers are charged by the mile. Um, you know, of all these, like these absolutes, these paradigms in the industry, one of them uh, that really stuck out with me was you have to have fleet managers. And so I, 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 I probed the group and said, why do you have to have fleet managers? And the answer was, well, drivers are lonely on the road and they want someone to talk to. And I'm like, that was the answer. That was the answer. And, and, and I was kind of shocked in that that's really, you know, really sad that we think that a driver who's on the road, who's working for two weeks at a time in a truck, that they want to talk to a so-called supervisor back at their their company, that that somehow, that connection was somehow important. Yeah. And it was a common held belief. It wasn't just by one or two people. And I'll be honest with you, I've heard that for as far back as I, as I can go, is somehow that connection was really important. And um, for said, those well, of okay. you who are listening to Eric, sorry to interrupt you, Eric, okay. could you put in the comments, if you guys have heard this before, that a fleet manager is often the biggest role of a fleet manager is to uh, be a <clears throat> connection to the home office and to be comfort on the road for the for the drivers. I'd be curious to see what other people are saying as well. Uh, right. I always love having those kind of comments, but go ahead, Eric. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so I said, well, what if, what if we can do something so that so the issue is the driver's connectivity and the driver's still alone in a truck and they don't feel like they have interaction with anyone right why don't we create a business model that gives them interaction with their family and their friends and their peers and gives them people they actually want to interact with give them the time to do so and even the mechanism to do so and stop trying to give them somebody that we that and unfortunately, they probably don't want to interact with them, right? And so it was things like that. And so we started really expanding the thought process as we started breaking down these paradigms. And when we left the room of the probably 200 paradigms that got put on a piece of paper, we didn't have a justifiable reason for like 180. Like th there wasn't a good reason. There was a, there was a reason, but there wasn't a good reason when wow. you really break it down. And so that's where we started to, that's the kind of the beginning of that. Started thinking through what a business model could look like. Um, and I started kind of scoping something out. And then early 2019 started looking for somebody to run it. Um, because I decided I wanted it to be separate from US Express. I wanted it Smart. to, because one of the things also in that book, I keep going back to that book, but it really opened my eyes is that incumbent companies will kill anything that's new that 
that makes them feel threatened, especially if one of the end games is cannibalization. So I wanted this, this business to be incubated outside of our four walls, separately in a completely different city. I didn't want it based in Chattanooga. Um, I wanted it out of our operations and I didn't want anybody from our business running it. I wanted an outsider running it. And I, in, in a sense, wanted an outsider with the unique viewpoint that wasn't necessarily, I didn't want to go hire a VP of ops at one of our direct peers because yeah. they probably wouldn't be thinking much different than our people. Would be. Um, this was the group that was arguing with me about those paradigms, right? So I yeah. wanted to bring somebody in. And so we started looking in early 2019 to bring somebody in that had fresh ideas that would match what uh, I felt like was needed uh, to build something like this from scratch. And then that's how you became uh, friends with Cameron. And then- right. It was the fifth choice. <laughs> Nowhere near the top of the pile. But somehow, I, somehow I got the job. Are you in Tennessee, Cameron? No, I'm actually in Atlanta. So the office here is is right on Georgia Tech's campus. It's right across the highway from them, right on Tech Square. Nice. I love yeah. Atlanta. Um, yeah, we so love it. How, so how did you know where to start with what Eric's vision has become, and where we're going so with this idea? We came in here. It was just it was it was just an idea. They'd done a ton of thinking about. It. I say Eric. I say they. Eric, the management team. Um, but there wasn't a lot of kind of meat on the bone quite yet. Um, we, there were a few things right away that for a long time, just as an observer of the asset base community and, and really a partner to them in, in my last life that were fundamentally broken about the industry. And that was the fact that driver attrition is hundred percent a year. Crazy. Hard providers, right? That in no healthy environment in, mm -hmm. in no healthy industry is that, are those conditions the case, right? So there's something really broken here. Uh, and the second thing is that the way that the, the fleets are planning and kind of orchestrating themselves is entirely manual. And so this and, and that whole process around kind of planning and deciding what load to take for the truck and what loads do we already have and which truck should we assign to them is really just a very, very complex math problem. And computers are better at math than humans. They always will be, they always have been, they're faster. And so that was really where that made just the most sense kind of logically to start. So we started building the, this kind of first generation optimizer. There was there were remnants of it. There was an optimization engine there. We kind of stripped it down to its bare bones and built it back up again. Um, and that was really where we started. We just said, can we automate the planning process? And it wasn't automation for any other uh, reason besides it should yield a better result for everybody. The driver mm -hmm. should get more miles. We should, we should be able to, the more miles, that, quite frankly, that we run, that's the way we're paid. It's also how they're paid. It's better for everyone. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we put in there to, that, that it became kind of a very early North Star for us was this attrition problem. And it's the number one measure of success for us today is, can we have exceptionally low attrition? That is our barometer for, for success. And one of the ways to do it is to make sure that you give your, you keep your drivers moving, right? That they get a lot of miles. And so the optimizer solved both these problems the second reason that we found why drivers were, were attriting was home time. They were missing home times. They were missing life events with their family. And so we made it an immutable law in the optimizer. You are never allowed to miss a home time ever. Get a driver home at all expenses. And that's really all it is. It's way more sophisticated than that, but kind of objectively, the functions are to maximize those revenue miles and guarantee that driver gets home. And it's amazing how, how many problems that, that solves right out of the gates. And so yeah. we got to work on that. We took it live in August and-, and it was yeah. Wow. So how has it been going? And what did you build? Did you build everything uh, yourself or did you use third party? Oh, we, we've, we've had a, a kind of, we take a, a pretty practical approach to that. Some case, when we deem it to be a competitive advantage, we build it entirely in house. If it's something that somebody else has already solved and it's not kind of core Makes to our sense. business necessarily, we're fine kind of adopting and, and integrating different so it's, it's, it depends is, is the right answer. Um, we have, we're actually in the process of building our second generation optimization engine and releasing it either later this month or next month with kind of all of the learnings from the last year kind of built into it. And that is built entirely uh, in-house from scratch. Do you, so um, what are you automating? So I, again, it's, it's a little less about automating, but I, it, it, the, from a mission standpoint, it's really just about doing things more effectively and trying to yield a better outcome. Um, we are, there's both the, there's, you know, US Express is, is a big company. We have you know, 
$1.5, billion worth of freight, a lot of freight to play with. We also at times have network gaps where, so from one standpoint, we're automate, we're not automating, but we're, we're orchestrating the, the, the planning of the assets with all of that freight in mind. But also when there's very natural kind of uh, network gaps, we're able to go out to the marketplace, the, the $800 billion of other freight and try to pull in freight to supplement it. And that process, that very iterative process of, of kind of constantly looking at hours of service and looking at the freight we have and what freight is available is all done and orchestrated instantaneously. And it yields for the best outcome for those drivers, right? Guarantees, get some revenue miles, get some home. So the data that's being fed into your company and into this new software um, is hours of service data, I guess, GPS locations, um, any, anything about maintenance? Uh, the, yeah, we, so we, uh, US Express does a fantastic job of preventative maintenance. It's a very sophisticated, the, the department is, is, is really well done. So we take those as inputs, right? So we have a lot of preventative maintenance. So we, we design and plan the fleet around those. And then, um, and then where the drivers live, apparently, or where they, what will they call their home base? Yep. Um, and then obviously what shipments they're on. Um, I thought I saw a shipper pop up and say, hey, how do you ensure, if you're trying to get them home all the time, how do you ensure that they, how do you eliminate the empty miles? Um, so that's a part of that. In the, in the long run, it's about making sure that you have drivers that are close to your shipping facilities, right? So there's there's a whole kind of how do you bring in new drivers? And that's that's the long term. In the short run, there's some amount of acceptable deadhead and you have to be okay with that. I would like no less, no more than 10% deadhead at any point in time. But, you know, sometimes you break that because you got to get the driver home. You can't have them miss their daughter's graduation or or any other, their, their son's football game, right? It's, it's not worth it. So a few extra percentage points is, is nothing in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, the, the good, the, the nice thing is that our side, there's so much opportunity. So whether we have access to customers or brokers or anyone in that, if we have to get a driver to a certain location, as long as we can predict that and plan for it on the front end, we usually can find freight that will get that driver as close to home as possible. So it's not a matter of, sit in a driver a thousand miles to their house or anything like that. There's so much opportunity in the market and, and we have access to a lot of that. That's really nice and fortunate. Um, are you finding that drivers care more about home than they have been about uh, pay? Um, it's not really either or, right? Okay. It's not binary. It's, 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 it's yes, you need both of those things, right? And the, and the third piece of it is about support. And so we talked about the, the, the fleet manager earlier um, I, I couldn't agree more with what Eric said, is it, but the whole idea of supporting drivers is important. And so we, we wanted to, to create a community where drivers could interact with each other. They could interact with what we call the ops team. So drivers have an ops team rather than a fleet manager, right? And the difference is really a level of empowerment. So when they call in, any problem they have, the person that they are talking to, they can solve the problem immediately right there. Um, so that it really increases transaction speed, increases driver satisfaction. Um, and it's really not too novel of a thought. It's just give them kind of a concierge, give them a, give them a yeah, group of people that like are that. make decisions that can remediate whatever problem they have. If they want to just call and, you know, just talk, that's fine too. I mean, just, they can call in, but we also have built into the app a way to communicate so they can, they can do it however they want to. They don't just have to call. I'm going to pop over. I do want to say that I was able to take a quick glimpse and Amanda Miller's helping me out. She's a broker in um, Alabama. God bless her. She's my friend. Um, she's a flatbed broker. She's helping me out kind of fielding some of these questions into Zoom so, we, so I don't have to um, watch the comments as closely. But I did see that a lot of people um, supported what Eric said, not like you didn't have support already. But it's always interesting to hear what people outside of your company or uh, in other areas of the country say. Uh, but they all have said for years and years the fleet manager's role was exactly what you said, which is something new for me to learn because – I don't know. I thought the fleet manager was more on routing and safety and supervision, kind of. Um, so that's such a good learning for me. Um, yeah, the, the driver's friend or buddy was always a part of that job, whether it was in the actual job description or not. But it was, it was definitely an expected. So role. interesting. Um, so we have a couple questions um, coming in. Eliminate empty miles. We found we got that one already. Anyway. Um, there's a follow-up question for the empty mile question, which was, and if you did eliminate the empty miles, would your cost not be lower to the shipper as empty miles don't need to be covered? I'm going to guess this came from a shipper. Yes. Um, yes. In the long run, you're, that's, that, that should be true, right? We should be able to drive 
as we continue to grow and as we should scale, there should be efficiencies for everybody. He's giving um, you a softball, isn't he? Yeah, but it's not mean, fair. He, this guy, yeah. I know who this is. He he's so mean to me all the time. Um, and then he says, or is it just profit margin for the carrier? Well, we could use some of that, but um, honestly, this isn't you know an exercise in profiteering, right? We're a publicly traded company, so there's no hiding. Um, yeah. So you can you can certainly look up our profit at any point in time historically and, and, and now. But at the end of the day, this should create good for everybody involved. It should be good for the driver. It should be good for us, and it should be good for the shipper. But you know, we are we are 15 months into this mission, and we have a long long way to go. Yeah, I think the the best way to look at it is that we're spending a lot of money in infrastructure on the front end. There's a lot of investments, but as this thing scales, that's where you get that efficiency. And as it scales to 2,000, we're sitting right below 500 trucks today. But if you're when you scale to two, three, four thousand trucks, it's much like the the digital broker argument too. Once you get to a certain size, you have a fairly low operating cost versus the normal. Uh, you know, manual operating costs. So as you get size and scale, then that's where you get your cost of efficiency. And so that's where we think there's real opportunity. And as we talk out probably, you know, two years from now, three years from now, we'll be discussing, do we, do we scale? Do we grow? Or do, you know, are we, do we get to a certain level and we're happy with, with being at that level and that profit level? Or do you get a little more aggressive in the market and you try to scale and get market share? And, you know, those are things that, uh, you know, we'll determine down the road. So let's throw another coal on the fire. Um, again, remember that I'm like just a, I'm just a dumb lawyer that likes to pretend she's a truck driver sometimes. But, um, but uh, so how can, how do you, how are you, Cameron, building in the biggest, fr one of the biggest frustrations in our industry, which is detention time. It's not, <clears throat> I guess, w waiting time. I should say waiting time has been the first frustration is how often they're left waiting for four hours um, in certain locations. Uh, to load and unload, um, and then pay is a whole nother situation. But I would love to know if you guys are working on that or if that's in the pipeline. And w and what you're seeing, too, would be interesting since I'm kind of an outsider. Yeah, I'll take a stab at this. I know Eric could talk, probably write a book on, on the topic of dwell. Um, we measure every instance of dwell. There's a few types of dwell, right? You have dwell between appointment times. You have dwell between loads. You have dwell after you're done with your hours of service break before you get your next one. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of types of dwell. We measure it at an exceptionally granular level and, and constantly are looking at the network to try to engineer that waste out. Um, and that goes for everything from kind of optimizing your appointment times to just trying to plan better, just trying to make sure that you're, you're putting the best uh, truck on your loads at any given point in time and, and vice versa, right? One of the, one of the benefits to, to planning in this way is that we know the exact, on the driver's four hours of service blocks, we know exactly when they're going to become available and we know the best truck, the best load to assign to that truck, right? So we can just by virtue of having this all in a single system that is 90 plus percent automated from a planning perspective, we measure every bit of it or constantly trying to, to reduce it. I bet. I bet you get some really good data too. Um, how is oh, it going? It. <laughs> and yeah, how's it, how's it, have you had any success stories with showing a shipper? Like, hey, you're, here's all your wait times at your facilities. Like, we can... No, it's, it's interesting. So we, we're actually, on Monday, we're releasing um, some functionality that will give us even better insights for our shippers. Uh, we're, we're calling it Yelp for Facilities. Um, this is yes, entirely, yes, I like that. Not an entirely new concept, but uh, right. certainly applied in a very new way. Um, so you have the, the very rudimentary five-star rating system. How was your experience here? It also is for truck stops. It's for anyone, but getting immediate driver feedback um, documenting the amenities, figuring out the tips, right? Hit one, two, three, four star when you get in, which is usually a phone call or 20 minutes of waste just to get that. And it's all immediately shared to every other driver in the network and stored in a, in a singular location. And what we'll be able to do is aggregate this information over time and serve it back up to shippers in addition to, cool. you know, the, the geofencing we already, we already know when the driver enters a facility and when they leave. So we can provide that today. But we're we're trying to to enhance the the level of granularity and feedback directly from drivers back to shippers to help them improve their operations or and quite frankly in some cases help give us feedback where we can get better. Yeah, and, and one of the things that we're we're going to use that data potentially down the road, you can even use it from a, a pricing standpoint. So whether it be through some sort of uh, you know refund back to the customer or or something. There, there's a number of ways that we can take that data, but if you think about 
the time it takes to load a truck and unload a truck. And if a customer can squeeze an hour on the front end and an hour on the back end, that has real value to us. And there's opportunity to get some of that value back to the customer. So a behavioral change type mechanism where if the customer is willing to change some of their behaviors, then there's, there's a financial benefit there. And so we're, we, we take that data now and use that internally to price. And, and you know, when we're looking at bids, but we think there is a more dynamic opportunity here where you can take that data in real time and somehow use it, feed it back to the customer and use it to incentivize not only uh, our behavior, but their behavior, because at the end of the day, you, we can tie financially both of us to that benefit. I'm, I'm very excited about this. This is way cooler than I thought it was. Um, so I actually didn't have any ideas of what it would be, but. I was like, Here, we're either going to be something super boring or something cool, but this is very cool and very freaking needed. Um, <clears throat> oh, I forgot. So we're at halftime, and this is what I do at halftime. This is new now because LinkedIn is very spotty, and I do not like – no offense to anybody who's on Facebook right now, but I'm not a fan of Facebook at all. So for those of you – I'm going to play my little intro music. <clears throat> for those of you who are on LinkedIn, who are on Facebook or Twitter – um, head on over to YouTube. We are going to talk about a couple of the questions I have for Eric and for Cameron. Um, you get to submit your own questions. I mean, when's the next time that you're going to get people like this to ask questions uh, directly to live? So I'm shutting off the feed to those uh, resources and whenever I can find them. And then we will continue on. Sorry, guys. I don't really know what happened to uh, my tech. But I'm going to shut off Facebook, I'm going to shut off LinkedIn, and then we're going to continue on our lovely journey. <clears throat> MySpace. <laughs> Someone just said MySpace. Smart pants. All right. Um, okay. So here's what I want to do. I want to give people time to get their questions in, um, although I saw some floating around that were pretty good ones. And then I have a few more questions for you guys. But here's the thing. Eric. Now I know who to pick on. Cameron's cool with me asking questions. <laughs> Eric starts to tense up. I can see him and he's starting to like, oh gosh. Eric's going to need a drink after this. I have one All now. Right. Eric, you're going first, of course. <laughs> I already know the answer to this one, though. Eric, have you ever, and don't you can't lie, though, have you ever... Have you ever sang karaoke? I have. You have? Uh, are you a good singer? Oh, horrible. Horrible. Are you? I see. Okay, here's the thing, guys. I want to go karaoke, like singing or whatever you call it. Obviously, we can't right now. But I'm too scared. Like, I, did you know the words? What song did you pick? It was a Merle Haggard song. Um, a couple Merle Haggard songs. For some reason, Merle Haggard seems like a good karaoke uh, song. So, uh yeah, the comments are going to light up about this. Yeah. And then, okay, how'd you, so you say you were horrible, but did you know the words or did you have to follow the bouncing ball or whatever? Mostly knew the words, but it's nice to have the words sitting up there in front of you, right? So yeah. Just, now, granted, this was 20 something years ago. So it's oh, it been was? a long time. It wasn't just a couple days ago in your living room? Yeah. Because <laughs> that'd be cool too. No. Karen, have you gone um, karaoke? I have. I can't stand karaoke. My wife loves it. I, I am a terrible singer. And is your wife a good singer? She's not watching. Don't worry. What's that? Your wife a good singer? I, I suppose so. I don't know. I try. I, I can't. I hate karaoke. I'm like you. I, I don't like being up there. I don't like the whole thing. And then for those of you who karaoke, <clears throat> why do you want to listen to somebody up there squawking? That's what I, I don't get. It's yeah, I don't get the it. The oddest thing. Sure. Hold on, let me see what people are saying in the comments. Cassandra could karaoke on Bulls on Parade. Whoever wrote that is the coolest person on the planet. Um, and I think I would scare everyone out of a bar room if I did Bulls on Parade, which is the best song ever. Um, someone says that my brother-in-law owns one of Murley's old tour buses. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Um, and then people are listing off songs that you could sing. Um, <laughs> David Allen Co. Mama Trains. I don't know this, you guys. You guys are crazy. You don't have to call me Darlin' Darlin'. Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. Okay. 
I, I can't do karaoke. I can't. <clears throat> That's a karaoke classic. I can't do it. Jerry Reed. Oh, they love karaoke. You guys have problems, man. All right. So <clears throat> last question for you guys. To That one was an easy one. I switched it at the last minute. Wait. Where did the questions go? I oh, man. Where'd they go? That's not much room around here. Aha. Eric, I found them. Okay. This is so fun. All right, Eric. No, no. Yeah, Eric. It's more fun. <laughs> All right. Hmm. Eric, never have I ever, or have you, gone dumpster diving? Dumpster diving. I have not. <laughs> man, you missed out on some good stuff. <laughs> I just went last week, man. <laughs> I got it like... See, that's the hipster millennial thing. Uh, Cameron, have you gone dumpster no, diving? I have never. No ever coyote paid you enough for that? I would, I would do that, but I haven't. <laughs> Man, you guys. Um, we also have one other thing on my list that we need to talk about is why Eric has never seen the Hunger Games. I know. That was shocking. I didn't even know what they were, actually. No. I, in fact, I looked it up, and it looked like um, Lord of the Flies to me. So I was like, oh, it's like Lord of the Flies. A little bit. Wow. Okay. First of all, um, the Hunger Games books are amazing. I've read them like 20 times because just so you guys who are confused why we're talking about the Hunger Games, I asked Eric and Cameron, I said, which one would you prefer if I had to throw you in right now at this very moment, which one would you prefer? Hunger Games or Jurassic Park? So are you going to get killed by humans or are you going to get eaten by dinosaurs? Um, I'm going Hunger Games because Jurassic Park is the scariest, most terrifying thing on the planet. Um, Cameron, I think you did Hunger Games yeah. too. No chance of going to Jurassic Park. And if you were in Jurassic Park, you know the raptors? You know they're the most dangerous ones. Do you remember them? Oh, yeah. But it was hard to play this game because Eric hadn't seen Hunger Games, which he promises Madtropolis he's going to watch at least the first Hunger Game movie or read the book. It's really good. Okay, so a dying question that I have, a burning question I have for you guys, not dying, burning is when is this technology going to be available to the rest of us? Eric, oh, wait, wait. On? I don't even think Eric is allowed to talk about that. Have you talked about it yet, Eric, in public? Yeah, I mean, we, we really what we've talked about is... I'm selfish, Eric. I just want you to yeah, know that. And we're, we've launched our, I mean, we've launched our fleet. We have 475 trucks or so operating on this platform today. And uh, we, we're planning on op, we're planning on putting another say fifteen hundred trucks over this platform over the next four or eight quarters, and we've we've talked about that on the earnings release, and um, we don't have any plans on releasing this like externally in a sense like for other um, companies or other you know trucks or carriers today. Um, but I think that you know over time. The, the nice part about this is there's so many things as Cameron and I'll occasionally brainstorm and I, there's a thousand different directions this thing can go. Um, but we're probably two years or at least four quarters, six quarters from having to decide which is our next direction. We have, we've got a couple phases here that are already well laid out that we know that we've got to work on. And there's a lot of stuff. If you talk about a lot of this technology, I mean, Cameron, would you say maybe 30% of it's built? I mean, there's a lot to be built. There's so much. There's so much extra that needs to be done here on this model to get the full benefit from and actually get even better improved results. That will take another, you know, 12 to 18 to 24 months. But yeah, there's a lot of opportunity here for us to take it in a lot of different directions over time. Okay, how do you prioritize? Because I know what that feeling is. Because sometimes uh, I'm on this mission where um, I'm going to educate everybody in the industry every single person. I'm going to offer you free education. There's going to be paid education. I'm on a mission. I will, I will, until the day I die, I will figure out how every single person can be educated on our industry. Um, so, but my mind explodes every day with ideas. Um, so how do you prioritize? You know, one of the nice things I think about being public is, is it kind of keeps you very disciplined and mm. you've got to, you got to be very intentional about the things you're doing and why you're doing it and what the benefit is. And so that actually probably keeps us a little bit more on track because 
every quarter we, we talk about what we're doing and what the benefit and expectations we're going to get from that. And that keeps us from that whole game of, of going a thousand different directions. And I think if you're a private company, it's probably harder to be that disciplined because yes. you don't have that kind of external force that almost forces that discipline. Being public, we don't really have a choice, right? If I say something on the last quarter's call, I'm going to get asked, asked about it on the next quarter's call. And if that was a fleeting moment and we've already moved on to something else, then th they're going to take me to task on that. And so it's that's the that's the nice part. Now there's some you know some negatives about that too, but the the nice part is I think it does help to, to kind of keep you on task when you're doing something transformational. Totally like makes sense. I never thought of it like that. And you have a much bigger ship to kind of be churning. And the opportunity. Startups and smaller companies. I'm sorry. The opportunity that we have in front of us right now with just what we're doing is so big. I mean, we can spend years doing this and not diversifying to other products and be perfectly happy. So it's, uh, I mean, the easiest way to look at it is, you know, the ease of the implementation of that opportunity with the size of the opportunity. So we'll look at it. But right now we have, like Eric said, we have a lot more work to do just to get a lot more of the things that we have in kind of proof of concept phases and, and MVPs into kind of productionized, scaled environments. And we have we got a lot of work to do. So we're going to stay very focused for the meantime. What else are you guys seeing in the industry that's catching your eye, that's interesting um, or frustrating? Um, what else is on your radar? Uh, I didn't want to, I kind of monopolized both of you with this technology because I'm so curious about it. But, I mean, we have two brilliant minds with us. We might as well find out what else you guys are looking sure. at. I, you know, from my standpoint, I think there's opportunities on the non-asset-based side as well. Um, it's something that, you know, that we've also worked on. Nothing, nothing really exactly like this, but uh, looking at how we can apply technology. Again, learning from the digital brokers, but seeing if there's an opportunity to do something a little different. Um, and so we're exploring that. I would say that's kind of more, you know, exploring kind of skunk works than it is anything that's that's out there. But that's something that, you know, we have looked at, we talked about, and we think there's some interesting ideas out there that we could potentially apply to our brokerage business over the next couple of uh, years. Oh, you guys do um, have a brokerage business? We do, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, that's variant. That's part of the U.S. Express portfolio. Uh, wait, say that again. I'm sorry. It's separate from Variant, just for the the yeah. here. It's, it's, it, we Makes are sense. a massive based trucking company. Because um, Variant was designed solely for this concept of automation. Yeah. Okay. Um, with the logistics side of your business, um, how what have you been focusing on that you've been able to talk about publicly, um, specifically, if you remember anything? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the it, it, it's a tough business right now. I mean, I, if you look yes. at what's happened over the last couple of years from the digital brokers. They got real aggressive from a rate perspective. I think rates in 2019 were reflective of that environment in which the, the digital brokers were coming in and essentially trying to buy market share. If yep. you look at on a relative basis, we haven't seen that type of rate degradation in a long, long time. I would even go back to 08, 09. Um, and I think that if you, if you kind of looked at the environment that you had from a supply demand perspective and the rates, they weren't aligned. And I think because you had this extra dynamic that it hadn't existed in the past where people were aggressively coming in and buying market share. And I think it exacerbated the downturn in 2019. I think now you're seeing price discipline in the brokers because they don't have a choice and they're having to, to get to profitability. And so it's it's squeezed a lot of uh, a lot of margins on the broker side, including ours. So uh, we've gone, we've seen our margins go negative actually over the last couple of quarters. Um, that's something that's being addressed. There's a lot of repricing happening, and obviously we can get back to profitability over the next couple of quarters. But it's uh, it's something I think that's affected a lot of people. From a leadership perspective, how are you handling? Because I do see often in the comments and whatnot, uh, people are really, um, I think, okay, so in back in April, we had a whole show about rates. Um, we had brokers and carriers and shippers getting on and they were arguing over rates, And but it was very educational, even though it was professional arguing. But it was educational and, um, and enlightening. And obviously, one of the biggest things that came out 
was you just need to continue to build your relationships with each other. Shippers, brokers, and carriers all need to build their relationships. So then we turn around this corner and we're back in a new rate situation where the carriers have the power. And I'm hearing constantly that they have, especially the smaller carriers, have forgotten their relationships. And I think that's what the logistics professionals right now are just ripping their hair out about. And from a leadership perspective, what are you communicating to your folks, um, whether it's in trucking or in logistics, uh, right. to keep them going uh, and motivated? Because it's, it's a grind right now. It, it is. I think communication is really important. Staying in touch with the customers, um, making sure that they understand what we're seeing and what they're seeing. Um, this week, I had uh, Zoom calls with our top 10 uh customers talking to them about the environment, what we're seeing in the market. You know, there, there's a lot of things going on that are really, uh, I would say, very different than in previous cycles. And, and one thing I'll, I'll give you is it, you look at the turn that we're seeing in the market, it's really a supply driven turn. Um, demand on a, on a macro level is flat to a little bit down. If you really look at the overall macro environment, but supply has really come out of the market a lot over the last six months. And in fact, you look at the drug and alcohol clearinghouse, um, there's you know, 25, 30,000 drivers that are in that clearinghouse that are no longer really eligible uh, to be hired. Um, that's a significant amount of drivers. And yes. then if you go to the states, the state CDF, the states have issued about 100,000 less CDLs in 2020 today than they did in 2019. Uh, partially because a lot of these schools were shut down for six to eight weeks um, due to obviously COVID, they weren't considered essential. Um, you've got the uh, stimulus bill, which is paying people on the unemployment side. So people aren't coming into the industry. You know, typically when you saw economic downturns and people lost their jobs, they'd go into trucking. You're not seeing that partially because of the, the unemployment benefits that have been rolled out. And then uh, thirdly, now that the schools have come back and the CDLs and, and state DOTs are open back up, everybody's kind of got this social distancing, so no one's running that capacity. And so 100,000 less CDLs to date, I think there's probably going to be, if you look at by the end of this year, but, um, probably 50,000 less CDLs for the balance of the year compared to the back half of last year. Um, and then throw another, say, 20 some odd thousand drivers into the drug and alcohol clearinghouse. There's a possibility we may be down 200 to 225,000 drivers just from entering 2020 to exiting 2020. That is a seismic amount of capacity coming out of the market. If you think about 18 to 19, there was about a, a you know, everyone talked about supply getting built back into the market. There was about 40,000 extra trucks or drivers that came into the market that created that big gap between 18 and 19 and now we're talking about 200 to 225,000. Um, I, I think that's a story that could that could be around for quite a while. Do you think as an industry that um, those of us who are in it, do you think we're a little bit addicted to the volatility? Oh for sure. Oh for sure. It's so erratic. It's not there, there's nothing stable. I mean it's just in a sense. I mean it's it, and almost on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, mm -hmm. you, in, in our business, we can almost model it on an hour-to-hour -hour basis. I mean, it's wild. But uh, yeah, there is. It, it's it's definitely that instability. I think attracts a certain type of person. I think it does too. I think I mean I think I'm one of them as well. But it's awesome. I'm also constantly searching for stability in this industry. But I still want change and improvement. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the stability. I think in rates and and volume will never really truly be achievable. But at least in rates, this is like the most we've ever seen these changes over the last six months. It's terrifying yeah. in a way. Um, but I think it also, uh, the strongest will probably come up uh, and prevail the most. Uh, the couple questions that were popping up um, for you guys. So one question was, what's the um, main feedback, the number one thing you're letting your shippers know that they need to improve with their facilities? The thing that you're constantly having conversations about, if any. Yeah, obviously wait times, um, both on the load and unload, are, are incredibly important. But I, the biggest thing is taking care of the drivers. I mean, we're we're in yeah. with with the driver situation like it is, and I can tell you, it's only going to get worse. 
Um, we as a company are going to prioritize those shippers that provide bathrooms, provide rest areas, provide places for drivers maybe to get something to eat or drink. And those customers, and you're seeing less and less of that, but you've had customers that don't allow drivers to use the restroom and don't right. allow drivers on their, that get out of the truck or on their property. We are taking that into account when we're doing bids. And um, if there's a customer that we that we start to see, like from Cameron's information, the drivers are saying, this is a difficult shipper. I don't like it. They don't treat me well. They don't provide these things. We may just not bid on that business or we may price it, you know, for, you know, for whatever reason in a different manner. But it's uh, that stuff's going to drive a lot of driver satisfaction is really important. And it's really important that the customers play a role in that. I absolutely love that answer. I think everybody else is going to love that answer. Um, I, I, we had maybe three weeks ago, we had an episode where one of our famous shippers, uh, Ron Kane, who we call the freight godfather, he was on with a couple other carriers and brokers. And we were talking about why the facilities are so difficult for drivers. And, um, and you know, Ron's theory has always been, I want, I want my, at my facilities, I want drivers to want to be there. I want them to be happy. So then I get the best drivers, I get the best carriers. And so he took the opposite role, but there are other concerns and you guys don't have to deal with this, which is uh, the majority of carriers do not have workers comp insurance. So they don't, shippers don't want them. They, they want them, but the risk is too high to have these carriers on their property too long. And I thought that was pretty interesting, a little bit irrelevant to your world, yeah. uh, the, both of your worlds, but in a way I thought that was interesting because it's quite accurate. Um, I have another question. Some people were curious why you decided to make Variant a separate entity. I missed that completely because legally it makes sense to me. I like that. Well, so for us, again, it was, it was that change management piece, right? We could layer in this technology, but we really felt like that doing something different and, and being able to start from scratch was, was a big part of it. And then from a branding perspective, you know, we've been around for 35 plus years and there's a lot of reputational issues from a driver perspective that, that you get both, both positive and mm -hmm. negative. And, um, and so there, if you go out and pull a hundred drivers, you would find a fair amount of drivers that said, I will never work for you express. Maybe they weren't there in the past. Maybe they had a friend or family member, but there's always that reputational problem that any company that's been around for a long time is gonna have. And we thought because this was so new and so groundbreaking, we thought that it really prioritized the drivers and, and their, uh, you know, their satisfaction that we wanted a fresh start from a reputation standpoint. And we wanted to present this new brand as something completely new and fresh and hope that the drivers would give us that opportunity to introduce it and get comfortable with it before they came up with their opinion on how they viewed it. It makes sense. I like that. And so uh, I forgot to ask this part because I was making assumptions. Is Variant, uh, is Variant a completely separate entity or is it a subsidiary? No, it's a subsidiary. Okay. Uh, I forgot to ask that, but I didn't think anybody would be interested. And then they pinged me with the question. I'm like, they're so curious. Um, so here's a um, question that I would be curious if you guys had a, a position on or, or thoughts on how many drivers won't retire due to the financial hit in the first quarter. I never really, I never had a chance to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. I had, I would have no idea to ask. I mean, no way. Either. To know. And I think that, uh, Something we should yeah. chew on for a while is Madtropolis. Right. We should start thinking about that. I mean, you could say that for the entire country, by the way. Because mm -hmm. so for millennials, we often are saying, um, you know, first we were hit with the uh, recession in 2008. Now we've got COVID. And I mean, I have a lot of friends that are like, I'm getting, not going to be able to retire in this country because um, I just recovered from the recession. I felt like I was just getting back my feet up back on the ground. So it is to broaden that question. It is kind of interesting to think about, but uh, uh, I'll also tell you that um, it was another interesting point with carriers when they came on the show. Uh, for days, we tried to figure out what does it cost to run a load for like an owner operator? And there were so many drivers that didn't know the costs. Oh, so yeah. That's a big question. I think that has a lot of factors that go into it. Yeah, I think there's even carriers with 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe even a lot more trucks that honestly don't know that answer either. Mm -hmm. 
And let's expand on that. I think there are brokers too, because as a brokerage, it's kind of hard to know where you stand because you, you're laughing. You know what I'm talking about because there's money coming in and going so much. And so it's hard to know exactly where you stand. Um, I had a client once that I think it was like a hundred, two hundred million dollar brokerage. And <clears throat> when we actually sat down and went through the receivables and their finances, they were, they were dead broke, dead broke. Um, and they had no idea. Uh, so, um, I, I like pontificating and all these. Yeah, words. I think that cost thing was probably the most eye-opening for Cameron when he came in the door. Is that having that opinion? You know, your what you believe cost is in a broker versus cost from an asset carrier are not always comparable, and in fact, in a lot of cases, they're not. And I think that was probably right, Cameron. I want to speak for you, but I think that was significantly more complex P and L uh, for a number of reasons. There are things that you think are fixed that are actually variable, and it's. Uh, it's, it actually, in some regards, it's a much simpler equation. In other regards, it's, it's far more. It's yes. Just getting your arms wrapped around it is a little bit more difficult. So I went from working at Echo to Schneider. And boy, was that a just mind-blowing education. Um, and at, as a broker, you often are the insurance company and the bank <clears throat> and uh, the sourcer of carriers, which are all these roles. And I always thought like, oh God, it's a lot to run a brokerage because you have to fill these shoes. I got into asset and I was like, wow. And the, I'm not even gonna go uh, the direction of liability, <coughs> insurance and being sued all the time is a whole nother game plan, a, a whole nother story. Um, and for those of you who are interested in that, uh, I interviewed a very famous lawyer, Joe Freed. Um, and you can find that video on YouTube. It will blow your mind if you want to know more about the accident world for trucking companies. Uh, in fact, Eric, I know a bunch of the ass of your um, uh, of folks that are in your um, risk department mm -hmm. and they're handling claims. They're dynamite. Oof, dynamite. Okay, um, I want to keep asking you guys questions, but I need to not be selfish. Um, and I want to thank you both for joining us. Um, and for those of you out there uh, who uh, want to learn more, U.S. Express is a public company. So I, how I, I'm, I read through all of their uh, filings and I listen when they have um, their recordings <clears throat> of their releases. You can learn so much about a company. And that's how I learned about what Eric's been up to. And I'm constantly looking for people who are changing our industry. Um, so both of you, thank you so much for coming on this wild, crazy show. And um, Eric... Watch Hunger Games and sing a song in your living room because I think you need to bring back that karaoke guy and sing and and live, live life. And he's probably like, I'm never talking to this crazy lady ever again. Cameron, I know you're with us. <laughs> you're cool with us. You're like, I'm tired. I have a new baby. <laughs> Thank you for having us. I really appreciate, yeah, appreciate it. it. Thank you very much. And I will see you guys next Wednesday.